Hi, I'm Sarah Glassberg, and this is AJFF In Conversation, the Jewish film podcast. As listeners know from recent episodes, we at AJFF have been very busy this summer. One of the programs you will have heard us talk about was our June Selects screening. It was a virtual screening of a documentary called The Red Orchestra, and it was sponsored by the Helen Marie Stern Fund and the German Consulate. The Red Orchestra is a riveting docudrama about an anti-Nazi resistance network operating from within the Third Reich. It's such a unique documentary, and we, as always, were excited to host an exclusive Q&A. And as always, we wanted podcast listeners to be able to enjoy that conversation as well. It was moderated by Holocaust historian Dr. Deborah Lipstadt with filmmaker Carl Ludwig Rettinger. Without further ado, please enjoy this discussion of The Red Orchestra. <laughs> Hi, I'm Deborah Lipstadt, professor of history of the Holocaust at Emory University. And I hope you've enjoyed watching uh, this new film by Carl Ludwig Reitinger, uh, uh, The Red Orchestra. Uh, I found it a fascinating film, not just because it introduced me to, I knew about the Red Orchestra, but not in the detail I know now, having watched the film more than once. Uh, but also another subject, which I think will come up in my conversation with Carl, uh, the director, um, about how we look at history. So without further ado and further delay, I want to welcome Carl speaking to us from Cologne, from Köln uh, in Germany. And thank you for participating. And more importantly, thank you for making this film. And maybe I'll open with an introductory question. What intrigued you about this story? Yeah, first and most important, it's a story which is not very well known in Germany and even in Belgium, uh, in Israel, in Paris, where part of the story takes place. Second, um, this, the Red Orchestra as a, a, a rather important resistance a, a net of different assist, uh, uh, resistance groups um, has been mistreated after uh, the war, during the Cold War. Uh, in West Germany or in Western Europe, they have been seen as traitors because some of them gave information uh, to the Russian Secret Service and to the Russian military but from my point of view, this was a leg legitimate uh, a way of, of resistance. And uh, they never got the kind of recognition they should have, from my point of view. And that's the reason why I started to think about the film. But this actually already started in the late 80s. And then I didn't know how to make it because I only had some talking heads. And it took quite a while by coincidence that I found out there are two really large uh, fiction productions, which funny enough were shot in the same summer in 1970 on the height of the Cold War. And both have a certain element of propaganda in it. And this was the, the idea was to have these two fiction films and use excerpts on one hand to tell the story of the Red Orchestra, but on a meta level to reflect on the construction, how history is told, because these two films are quite different. You know, watching the movie, uh, the teacher in me, the professor in me, the instructor in me, said, oh, this would be fascinating. Have the students watch both productions and then talk about how the different presentations and then watch your film to see. It's almost history as a weapon, the interpretation of history. Uh, you can have your own, you can't have your own facts, but how you interpret it is quite, is quite different. And I think you make a very important point. For many people seeing this film today, watching the, uh, whether it's the excerpts or the recreations uh, of these uh, uh, spies or, or very 
one could call them a spy or one could call them loyal supporters of the effort to defeat the Nazis, saying we're going to do this for the Soviets, we're going to do this for the Red Army. One can bristle because one could think, oh, the Soviets, they were bad, etc. But when they're doing this, the Soviets are standing alone for all intents and purposes against the Nazis. I mean, uh, England is in the war, but hardly so. Uh, and we in the West often think of D-Day as the great beginning of the victory, you know, but the truth is if the Soviets hadn't, with all the mistakes they made and all the way Stalin more than bungled, but really almost obstructed the victory, uh, the story might have ended quite differently. Um, let me say one thing. The Russians sacrificed 15 million soldiers to defeat the German army. Uh, I think the, the, the Allied uh, uh, toll was 1 million. The German uh, uh, death uh, on the field have been 6 million. So the sacrifice of the Russians were enormous. Mm -hmm. uh, we really have to think about this. But anyway, this is one of the big uh, or sad elements of the drama of the Red Orchestra. They found themselves between a rock and a hard place. You see, they tried to get in contact with uh, uh, Great Britain. They tried to get in contact with the State Department, but they were rejected. So the only possibility was left to cooperate with the Red Army. And then even when they cooperated with the Red Army, they sent the Soviets news of the impending attack. The June uh, was a 22nd attack in, in, um, by, their, uh, by the Soviets' so-called allies, the Germans, with whom they had a pact. And Stalin not only rejected it, but cursed the person who sent it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, some of those 15 million deaths might have been saved had he paid attention and some and then when they get the information that the Germans are headed to the Caucasus to the oil supply and the armaments, he rejects that too. I mean it's it's a tragedy within a tragedy yes. within a tragedy. Yes, that's true. They risk their lives and actually many of them lost their lives to get these informations. Yeah. So you see at the beginning I thought it will be a great film. It's not about victims again. On the Jewish side, it's, a, it's, it's about resistance. And I have two heroes. I have Trapper. I have Schulze Boysen. It will be a great story. And the deeper you get, you find out it's not like this. They are, it's not the heroes. Of course, they are heroes in a way, but it's much more ambivalent. It's, there are tragic elements in it. And that's... On one hand, that's interesting. On the other hand, um, it's it's tough. But that's I think it's for me. Then it's also important to have this uh, view on history and not to have the same kind of cliche you have in the typical uh, history feature films. Yeah, right. Like, but there's like, another yeah. element. There's another element that you bring out towards the very end of the film. How former. Uh, uh, Third Reich, uh, Wehrmacht, you know, German are Nazi during the Nazi era, the, the German army uh, uh, officers, Gestapo officers, SS men use the story of the Red Army to rehabilitate themselves. Yes. You want to talk a you want to talk a little bit about that? This is historical yeah. revisionism of the first yeah, that's, order. That's and I think that's you see in Germany, this is also new. Actually, I'm proud because it was. Uh, uh, Joschka Fischer, the foreign minister of the uh, Green Party in the 90s, who started to say we need for all uh, institution ministries and uh, secret services, how was the influence of the former SS officers, of the former Gestapo officers uh, in these institutions after the war? And this influence was enormous. Yeah. And um, First thing, it's the survivors who tell the story and who make history. So most of the uh, Red Orchestra were dead. And the Gestapo people who were hunting them, they used the legacy of the Red Orchestra. And they said they are still active after the war. Now they want to, to uh, 
uh, subvert uh, the Western uh, uh, democracy, and they used it to fund the, um, uh, the German secret service uh, uh, together with Adenauer. And there was, they were mainly Wehrmacht officers, mainly Gestapo, SS, uh, so on. That's true, yeah. They used it not only to fund the German secret service, but to whitewash their own record. Of course, yes. And to say, have, we were heroes. We were heroes. Yeah. We were going after these spies for the no, Soviets. We are, we are the experts to fight against Bolshevism. That was mm -hmm. and and the the American uh, uh, and English Secret Service. They took took them. They partly gave them a new identity and paid them a lot of money for this mm -hmm. expertise. Mm -hmm. Well, our, our America's whole space program was built on not whole That's space, true. but a good part of it. Werner von Braun, yeah. uh, yeah. you know, using we want to get to those people. Uh, what is also unknown, but Uh, is implicit in your story is it's, as the war is ending, uh, the Allies are racing, the British, the Americans are racing from the West and the Soviets from the East, not just to defeat the Third Reich, but to collect as many of the scientists and experts as they can uh, so that the other side won't get them and they can can use them. Um, so it's it's wrapped up in today's in today's story. I'm also re watching that. I was reminded of the fact that um, Adenauer, the Prime Minister of, uh, of uh, West Germany, of the Federal Republic, um, his chief of staff was Hans Globke, yes. who was a minister in the, uh, uh, or was an uh, official in the Justice Department, the Ministry of Justice under the Nazis, and he wasn't alone. It was riddled with, with former Nazis. It's a, it's, a, it's a fascinating story. What, what surprised you most as you did your research? What surprised you most in making this film? First, I didn't know that most of the um, uh, people in the Russian secret service were Jewish. This was surprising for me. Uh, um, and it's easy to understand. These were the people who were able to speak foreign languages. They knew how to behave, you know. They had relatives in other countries. So they were very good to do these jobs. And, of course, they, many of them came from very uh, poor families and they were believing in the world revolution in the early 20s. And um, so they worked for the Secret Service. And after the war, most of them were killed or went into the gulag, or both, yeah. So this was interesting. Second for me was interesting, which I could not talk too much about in this film because there are so many aspects. I went to Israel. I had have some strong contacts there uh, since many years and did some research. And there was always a left... Um, part of the people who went in the 20s to found the kibbutz. Um, um, Haretz is, is uh, the name of this youth organization. And one part of them from the very beginning wanted to have to collaborate with the Arabs. They said, okay, we don't have a problem with them. The problem is the, the people the feudalist people of the Arabs and of the Jewish and of the British who are here. So we can work together. And the more conservative Zionists, the mainstream Zionists around Begin, for instance, yeah, they denunciated them, went to the British and said, you have to kick them out. And this was how all these people had to go out. And many of them ended up in, or some of them ended up in the Red Orchestra in Brussels and Paris. Mm -hmm. No, there's a, there was a great division. There was also a division among the socialists, Ben Gurion, Golda Meir, yes. uh, Sharet, all the others who become the le who, who formed the Israeli government and Israeli society till the mid till the late seventies when the Menachem Begin wins. 
who also saw wondered about this group. You know, I'm I'm working a little bit now on the topic of Golda Meir, who comes to the Soviet Union, comes to Moscow in 1949 as Minister Plenipotentiary, essentially Israel's ambassador uh, to the Soviet Union, and who discovers there that despite the Soviet Union's uh, support of Israel in the UN, uh, the the hostility towards Jews, the anti-Semitism, um, and Stalin's uh, irrational irrational hatred and distrust of Jews and of so many others, which of course is the same time when many of the people of the Red Orchestra are being put in Lubyanka prison, being sent to the Gulag. Uh, so it it all comes together. Well, I want to congratulate you on a uncovering. Uh, a too little known portion of history. Um, my guess is that it will start a very interesting conversation. Um, it probably will spawn other research. And what more can the historian, whether they're working as a film director or as a professor or as a writer, whatever it might be, want than knowing that their work left others with questions and, and wanting to dig further. So. I thank you and I congratulate you on a job well done. Many thanks for your interest and for the invitation to the festival in Atlanta. I'm proud on it. You should be. You should be. Be well. Thanks. Take care.